Good morning, church. Let's all come together and stand and praise the Lord in spirit and in truth and with voice and thanksgiving. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring. Every creature unique in the song is sing. All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, all struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. Told every lightning bolt where it should go, or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow. Who imagined the sun and its source to its light, yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night? a few announcements text connect and the number there on the on the projector on the screen if you are new and or if you're a visitor we'd love to get to know you better and we'd love that you would get to know us better and know uh, all the ways that we can uh, come alongside you and and help uh, to serve God one with another. Also, a reminder that junior baptism and membership class is happening for our kids third grade through sixth grade. That's Sundays, April 7th 
through 28th at 9 a.m. So that's going to be coming up for grades 3rd through 6th, junior baptism and membership class. And also, friends, I, while this is specifically talking about junior baptism, if you have a desire to be baptized and the Lord's placed that on your heart, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you want to be baptized, don't say, well, I'm not a third grader, so I shouldn't ask to be baptized. Go ahead and ask us about it. Amen. All right, we'd love, we'd, love to, we'd love to talk to you about that and show you about baptism. Also, I want to remind you, a high school night, April 13th, 6 to 9 p.m., contact person is brand new dad, Pastor Grant Winslow. Uh, it's going to be a night dedicated just for high schoolers. Come play Nine Square. Who knows what Nine Square is? Okay, yeah, I've, been, I've had that explained to me by Troy up here on the deck. I, I've never played Nine Square. Apparently, it's some uh, newfangled form of aerial Foursquare. I know what Foursquare is, but uh, but I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to play nine. It rocks, apparently. Yes, that's what he says. <laughs> All right, so you can shoot hoops, or I know what hoops are. Hoops are a little older than nine square, I think. Uh, Mr. Nains Naismith invented that. Or chill out on the couch with your friends. So register online contact is grant winslow also reminder that good friday service is march 29th uh coming up on friday it's good friday we'd love to worship the lord with you here on march 29th at 7 p.m we will be reflecting on the savior's love and the sacrifice he made for each of us the evening will include special devotional time and a time for personal reflection and also communion so you can prepare for that in your heart this week in prayer with the Savior. Nursery will be available for birth through age two. If you want more information, you can contact the church office. And also, Easter Sunday is March 31st. March 31st is Easter Sunday, the last Sunday of the month of March. We invite you to come and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord together at 9 o'clock a.m. or 10.30 a.m. There will be no ABFs, youth, or children's programs. Nursery will be provided for age zero to two years. Invite cards are available in your ABFs or in the full year to invite your loved ones and those in your community. Come enjoy music-filled presentation of the miracle of Jesus' death and resurrection. As he said, he is not here. He is risen. And if you want more information, you can contact me uh, or you can get a hold of us. But look forward to celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ with you in person on Easter Sunday. Can we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, as we come to this week, we proclaim your majesty. We humbly bow before you. And all those years ago, people waved, olive, uh, br waved branches, palm branches and myrtle branches as Christ rode in on the colt of the donkey saying, Hosanna, praise you in the highest. And Lord, we do praise you. And we thank you that our king was slain for us. We observe that this week. We remember that this week. And we thank you that he did not stay dead, but he rose again. So please keep us close to you. Provide us the way of escape from all temptation. Keep us in your word. Draw us into a new, fresh understanding and a fresh appreciation. And never let us lose our sense of wonder, Lord, in the power of the grace of Jesus Christ, of the love of Jesus Christ that he shows through the amazing work of the cross and the power of the resurrection. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and roll the video. In 2019, God opened an amazing door of opportunity in the school system of our continent of Africa. When some of our leaders started to approach one of the schools about the Awana program, the word started going to other headmasters. Schools walking to where we are running the Awana programs because they heard that we are coming and they said, please come and help us to start also the Awana program in our schools. And we introduced the Awana program in 30 schools. And eventually, we decided 
that we should invite the senior permanent secretary of the Ministry of Education to come and by God's grace, he accepted the invitation. And when she saw what was happening, she could not believe how much kids were so disciplined. And then the headmaster started telling her that this has brought relief to our schools. And then she said, this program must be in every school in this district. We started training in the community, Awana leaders together with the Christian teachers within the school to lead the program at that school. We are challenging kids to be able to read the Bible. Who is God? What is sin? How do they know God? How can they have a personal relationship with Christ? It helps them to, to have firm foundation. Be still and know that I am Lord. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. I praise you because I am fearful and wonderfully made. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God is my shepherd, I shall not want. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. These schools are, are doing far much better in terms of discipline, character development, and responsibility among the kids. Kids who are no longer attending school are now attending school. Kids were just throwing litter all over the place, and now they are picking litter all over the place. Teachers are able to fulfill their objectives of teaching kids. The community is being reached through the Awana program. Not only kids are being saved, teachers are being saved. Not only teachers are being saved, parents are being saved. Not only parents are being saved, even people from within the ministry, authorities are beginning to acknowledge the importance of this program in the schools. We have an amazing openings in other countries outside Zimbabwe. Malawi, Eswatini, Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia. These are just the minimum. God is opening such a huge window for us to be able to reach to a potential of 30 million kids that are just waiting for us to introduce the Awana program. These doors will never be open forever. But when God opens them, he knows that there are people, his people, we have resources to make it happen. We are praying to God to say, God, can you raise people that can come alongside us and say, hey, I've got a big heart for kids and I want to invest in the salvation of children. As much as the one-time gift of $650, you can reach the whole school with the gospel of Christ. These are the tender hearts that will change the entire continent of Africa. to show you that video because if you at all participated in our versathon uh, with our kids this past few weeks that's what you supported that is incredible it's an incredible opportunity that Awana has to go into the public schools with the Awana program to reach those kids I normally don't come up and necessarily share results with you of our versathon uh, every year but I wanted to this year uh, because uh, we have this Again, wonderful opportunity. I talked with um, Pastor Maposa, who was narrating the video about a week and a half ago. I got to talk with him, and I said, you know, millions of dollars are being put into Africa here. Is that too fast? You know, do we have, do you guys have the capacity to be able to train these leaders in these schools? Do you have enough churches to work alongside these schools? And he said, Brian, we got it already. Just fund it. And that was an amazing, amazing thing to hear from him, how, how they're ready to go. They have been praying for this. 
for years and years and years, and they're ready to execute it. And so it was super exciting to share that with our kids over the last few weeks, and that's what our Versathon funds will go to. We raised the most money we ever had in Versathon this past year. We just announced the results, and it's over $8,000 that we raised to go towards this. So, so thank you for your part in that. It's just so neat to see the kids get it. Uh, when we talk about missions and that they can make that difference. That's 10,000 kids about that Awana is going to be able to reach with a program through those schools for four years as they go through that program in the schools. And so thank you for your participation in that and uh, look forward to doing it again next year. Thank you. Isn't that wonderful? God is faithful and he blesses the gift and the giver and he blesses where it's going. His gospel is going out to the ends of the earth. Let's all stand together and sing about his blessed assurance and faithfulness. Blessed assurance, Jesus is. i 
family, I think it probably originates with my grandfather and grandmother, and uh, my dad would also say this as well. When uh, people tend to drift away from uh, attending uh, the body of Christ, whether it be on a Sunday morning or, or on a Wednesday night or an ABF or a Sunday school class, when, when people kind of fall away from coming together with the body of Christ, uh, my, my grandfather would say, well, I guess maybe they think they graduated. Yeah. Well, I, th I say that in jest. I mean, people, people will get discouraged. People will, will have various reasons why they fall out of the good habit of coming together with the body of Christ. And we need to not forsake the joining together. Amen. But it's, it's so important that we remember that we never graduate this side of eternity. I'm not perfect, are you? I'm not perfect. I have a perfect Savior. I have a perfect Savior who was slain for me and rose again on the third day. That's what this week is all about. And then if you, if you remember such things, on April 22nd, Passover is going to start, and you can remember it all over again. So you can remember it twice this year. We need him every hour, not just every day. We need him every hour, we need him every minute, every second. It's in him we have our being. He is the breath in our lungs. We don't exist without him. I can't walk the Christian walk without him. I don't have salvation without him, without the precious blood of Jesus Christ, his death and burial and resurrection. I don't have, I need him. You need him. We don't graduate in this side of eternity. And even in eternity, we praise his name forever and evermore. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So let's sing together about how much we need him every hour.
this next song, I heard, well, years ago, over 10 years ago. It's so precious to me because it reminds me that there's nothing in me that is worthy of Christ's love. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. Nothing that I achieve is worthy of God's love. Nothing that I earn is worthy of God's love. My wealth, my position, my power, my skill, my social standing, my reputation among men, nothing is word worthy of God's favor except Jesus Christ slain for me, his precious blood washing me clean of my sins his powerful resurrection. He is all that matters about me. Amen? I hope it's all that matters to you. I hope he's first place in your heart today. Don't let anything between. My worth is not in what I am. My worth is not in what I own. Not in my strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of
gracious God, as we come before you this day to open your word, we ask that you would bless your word in our hearing, in our hearts, and in our minds. Teach us your will and your way. Conform us to your character. Bless Pastor Dave as he brings your word to us. Give us clarity. Father, let there not be confusion, but let there be glory to the Son, the first and the last, who purchased our salvation on Calvary, who is glorified forever and ever, who is worthy of all praise, who is the sovereign ruler of all of creation. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good to see all of you here today. Most of you look like you have made it through the first few days of the tournament all right. Not too many out there sleeping, having stayed up last night until whenever it was midnight for the last game of the NCAA tournament. So yeah, we're good. Good to see you all here. Appreciate that you all got up this morning and made it out. Sorry for those of you whose brackets are blown. I know mine is. First round and my, my uh, you know, team I was taking all the way got knocked out in the first round. So I, you know, that pretty much blows it for me, but that everybody else out there, good luck on your brackets going forward and glad to see you here this morning. Can you take your copy of God's Word and open, first of all, to Psalm chapter 2? You say, I thought we've been studying Revelation together. Well, we are, and we'll get back to that, but we're going to start by looking at Psalm chapter 2. We're going to set a bit of context for what we're going to look at as we continue in the book of Revelation. And before we do that, as I do sometimes, uh, I'd like to ask you a question to kind of set the tone, kind of get us emotionally and, and involved and thinking in the way that will help us, I think, to grapple with the text in front of us. And, and, and what I have for you this morning is a question that I think we probably all experience, and that's, have you ever had one of those really great meals? I mean, something that you really enjoyed. It was delicious. It was just what you wanted. It, 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 it satisfied the craving and hit the spot, and you went, man, that was great. And then an hour, two hours, three hours later, something went wrong and you found, oh my, it just isn't working anymore. And the next thing you know, you're uncomfortable and then you're actually sick. And you're like, you say, what happened? You know? And Maybe it was just something about it that wasn't right, you know, and, and there it was. And I think we've all had that experience. Um, I've had it with different things in my life. Probably one of the worst was I actually really do like sushi. And when you get really good sushi, that's one of the best things that I find you can have. But if you ever get bad sushi, oh my. You know, and I had one of those where we, we, we went to this really great sushi restaurant. I mean, it was delicious. I loved it. I, I, I got the big platter, and I gulped it down, and it was magnificent. And about four or five hours later, oh, my, I was just churned inside out. Say, that's not an experience any of us enjoy. Say, Dave, what does that have to do with the Word of God? Well, I'm going to tell you, you're going to hear that same story that same series of events actually unfold as we get to Revelation chapter 10. And I want you to hold that thought in mind and even that kind of physical, oh, reaction in mind because that's going to play an important part. That very visceral, very physical sense of something that tasted really good at the beginning and tasted really bad later on, that's going to be an important part of understanding the message of Revelation chapter 10. Before we go there, though, I want to set the tone because what we're going to see in Revelation chapter 10 and what follows there is that it is a fulfillment of some prophetic utterances. And I want to start by looking at one of those prophetic utterances that we have in the Psalms. In Psalm chapter 2, a question is raised. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? I know so often we look at the Psalms and we kind of think that they're just this uh, compilation of individual choruses, kind of like a chorus book that we might pick up today. And yes, we know that they represent the Old Testament songbook. 
that these were originally somehow set to music, all of these psalms, and, and there are these beautiful poems set to music, and, and David, the great musician who wrote many of them. And we wrestle a lot because all that music is lost to us. But we also sometimes forget that there were a group of people who put the psalms together. Now, we don't believe they were necessarily inspired in the same way that the authors of the scripture were, but they were smart people who loved the Lord and they did things intentionally. And many times they ordered the books of the Bible and even some of the things that they see within it uh, for a purpose. And so when the psalms were compiled from all the individual poetry or, or the individual music into the order of the books we have, thought was put into that. And I will tell you there is a direct connection between Psalm 1 and 2. Psalm 1 introduces the challenge to a believer to walk in obedience to God. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's how this whole great book opens, is we are to be delighting in our God, delighting in the law of the Lord. And it talks about being like a tree planted by the streams of water, and then the wicked will not stand in judgment. That's the part I want you to see is in verse, eight of or verse 5 of chapter 1. It says, and the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of righteousness. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the wicked will perish. That theme is picked up in chapter 2, that the wicked will perish. And it says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? And the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed king. Why do we find that there are people who resist God, who rebel against God, who seek to fight against the rule of the Lord God in their lives? That's the question of Psalm chapter 2. So Psalm chapter 1 starts out saying, seek the Lord. Be that person who stands in the presence of God, righteous and holy. But the wicked will perish. Why do the wicked fight against God? That's how Psalm chapter 2 opens. And it says then in verse 3, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away the cords from them. Uh, who is it? This is the wicked crying out saying, I don't want God to rule over me. I don't want to be bound by the rules and the structures and the laws of God. The first psalm says, delight in the law of the Lord. And the second one says that there's a whole group out there, these nations and these peoples and these kings that rebel against God and they don't want to be bound by God. And verse 4 says, and he who sits on the throne laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree, the Lord said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel." This is God's response to the kings and the peoples who would rebel against him. It is to say, I have established my king. That's a great messianic prophecy. The son whom I have begotten. And he will have this great legacy of ruling over the nations. And those who rebel against them, he will judge in righteousness. He will break them with the rod of iron. He will smash them like pottery. You say, that's a pretty harsh image. Yes, it is. It's the image of a righteous king exercising judgment against rebellious people. And it's not pleasant. It's not easy. And verse 10 of Psalm chapter 2 kind of gives the punchline. It says, Now therefore, O king, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Way back here in the Psalms, there was this reality that mankind often and willfully rebels against God, rebels against the King of kings and Lord of lords, rebels against 
that only begotten son. And that's a foolish thing to do. They should be warned. They should take heed lest the wrath of the king be brought upon them. That's the warning from Psalm chapter 2. I tell us that because as we come to the section of Revelation that we are studying, that's the climax we are coming to, is we're coming to this time when the judgment of a holy and righteous God will be carried out upon the earth. Go with me, if you will, back to Revelation chapter 10. That's where we're going to start. Now, as I have suggested to you, chapter 10 follows on a very important uh, climax. And at the end of chapter 9, we have the, the last of the judgments that come from the trumpets. So, again, just real quickly to help us get the, set, the setting, because it's easy for us to forget and helpfully to remind us, and maybe those who haven't gotten here yet, we're in what amounts to a great poem, a great story that unfolds. And as I understand it, the purpose of this great poem or this great story is to reveal to us Christ in his righteousness and the holiness of his judgment. And in the end, it is to vindicate that Jesus Christ, yes, the one who loves, the one who is merciful, the one who is patient and enduring, he is justified in the judgment that we see in this very difficult book. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 introduced us to the risen Lord, the risen God-man who was the head of his church. And he warns us there in those messages to the churches, let him who has an ear to hear, hear the warnings. It's kind of like we just saw in Psalm chapter 2. In chapters 4 and 5, we see him revealed as the worthy lamb, the one who because he was slain for the sins of mankind and who rose again is the one who is worthy to bring judgment. No one else is because we're all under judgment, but he in his perfect righteousness is worthy. So he is worthy to open this scroll, this book of judgment. And so at the end of chapter um, uh, 5, Excuse me, at the end of chapter 5, yes, we see that the worthy one is able to open the scrolls. And that brings us to chapter 6 where it says, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. So this scroll, the seals are broken, and as we looked at, each seal un unleashes a judgment. But more than that, there's kind of a pattern. The first four seals were the judgments upon mankind, and then in the fifth seal in chapter um, 6, uh, in verse 9, it says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls who had been slain for the word of God and the witness they had borne, and they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign, Lord, all, o sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? This great question is raised now. So, so again, the seals open up God's judgment. The first four come out. The fifth one kind of breaks the pattern. We talked about this last week. And these martyrs, these just people who have suffered and been martyred, been killed in the name of Christ, cry out to God and say, how long before your justice will avenge us for the wrong that has been done to us? And I suggest to you that becomes a very important question for the rest of the book of Revelation. Immediately after that, the sixth seal is open, and this great plague, this great judgment pours out upon the earth, and the response of mankind is not to repent, but to run and hide from the wrath of the Lamb. That's the seals. I suggest in them that chapter 7 is an interlude, and that interlude shows us God's mercy and grace as he sets apart a remnant, the 144,000 of the tribe of Israel, of the people of Israel, excuse me, of all 12 tribes, and also then following, later in chapter 7, uh, verses 9 and following, the uh, unnumbered multitudes from the Gentiles. And, and this represents God's great covenant, his covenant with the people Israel, and then his covenant with his people, the church. That interlude shows us God's mercy even in the midst of judgment. Then we looked last week at chapters 8 and 9, and now we get into the second series of judgments, and these are described as trumpets. And if you remember, at the very, very end of uh, chapter 8, 
uh, I should say at the beginning of chapter 8, I'm getting ahead of myself here, the, uh, the, sixth, uh, the seventh seal is broken, and that releases the seven trumpets. And in verse 5 it says, And the angel took the censer filled with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth, and there were peals of thunder and flashes of lightnings and rumbles of an earthquake. And now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. Back in chapter 4, when Christ was revealed on the throne, there were the peals of thunders and the flashes of lightnings. Now, at the end of the first of the seals of the worthy Lamb, Again, as the seventh seal introduces the next series of judgments, the seven trumpets, again we see the peals of thunder and the flashes of lightning, and all that kind of releases those uh, trumpets. And again we saw that there were four that talked about the judgment upon the earth, and then beginning with the fifth one, something new is introduced, that pattern repeated. And in the fifth and the sixth trumpets, we see the first of three woes prophesied. And we looked at those last week. At the end of that, we come to chapter uh, 9, and it says in verse 20, and the rest of mankind, this is after a third of the earth and a third of mankind have been destroyed by the judgment and the plagues that were brought by those trumpets. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or of their sorceries, of their immorality or of their thefts. We suggested to you that this is now setting the pattern that vindicates Christ in his judgment. We've seen the seals, and mankind did not repent, but he ran and hid. We've seen the trumpets now, and mankind does not repent, but he runs. In fact, now he doesn't even run. He, re he, he remains rebellious against God, kind of like we saw in Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations raise? Why do they plot against their king? It's because they have hearts that are evil. They are broken and unrepentant. And it says, even after this discipline and this judgment, mankind did not repent of his evil ways, but he continued in rebellion against God. And so what will be next is the third series of judgments, and that's the bowls. And I want to give you just a quick peek or a hint. If you go to chapter 11, verse 15, it says, and the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. This is an announcement that that we saw kind of back in Psalm chapter 2, that God will give Christ kingdom and dominance over all of the world. And when you come down to, chapter, or to verse 19 of chapter 11, it says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within it, and there were flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and an earthquake and heavy hail. And that goes with this idea of the um, sixth uh, uh, trumpet being sounded and the opening of what will be the final set of, of judgments. Now those judgments don't start until chapter 15 and 16. And you say to me, well, what's going on in between? Well, again, remember this is like a huge poem and you're looking for patterns and breaks. And we saw that there was the pattern of the six seals and then the seventh one was announced and that brought in the judgment of the trumpets. But in between, there was chapter 7, this interlude in which we saw something about God's mercy and God's grace in holding for himself a remnant, the people of Israel, the people of the church. And then in chapters 8 and 9, six of the trumpets are sounded and those judgments come. And we see mankind again refusing to repent. Now we come to the time when the third set, and this will be the final set of judgments, the bowls are released. And much as we saw in between the seals and the trumpets, there was an interlude. We're going to see now between the trumpets and the bowls another interlude, and it's actually divided into two parts. We're going to see that there's chapters 10 and 11, and that's what we were just looking at. And then at the end of 11, we're going to see that the announcement comes of the bowl judgments. 
The seventh trumpet sounds, and the new judgments are about to be released. And then there's a kind of a second part to the interlude when we're introduced to the story of the woman and finally the dragon that represents Satan. It says over in chapter 12 that the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan to deceive the whole world. What's happening here is in these interludes, not only is Jesus giving us a look at his love and his mercy in the midst of these judgments, but he's also introducing some of the critical characters that we need to know as this story unfolds. So when we step back and look at this whole thing, we realize that what is happening is the book of Revelation is unfolding this story of judgment and it's giving us kind of glimpses into the heart of God as it's happening. The judgment represents the holy and righteous judgment of the king of kings. But at the same time, we're seeing this sense of mercy and this sense of protection on those who he sets aside as a remnant, even in the midst of the judgments. We saw that in chapter 7. We're going to see more of that in chapters 10 through 14. Then in 15 and following, we see that the bowls and that set of judgments will be released. So what we want to do now over this week, and, and we'll come back to it the week after uh, Easter next week, is we want to look at this question of how God is preparing for that final set of judgments. You say, Dave, this is uh, Palm Sunday. Why aren't we raving palm branches and, and uh, shouting Hosanna to him who you know, comes in the name of the Lord? Uh, I'd like to suggest to you that we are, and it may be a more difficult uh, act of praise than you think. Because when we shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna to the son of David, we are announcing the kingship of Christ. We are announcing that he is the one who is established as the ruler over all creation. And in that, we are asking him to be our righteous judge. And we may find that as the judge, we don't like the consequences. Because when he judges, he judges sin and he judges sinners. And that's the harshness of it. And that brings us now to this interlude. So again, just remember, we're at that point at the end of chapter 9 where the kings of mankind have refused to repent even in the face of all of the judgments that came out of the trumpets. He ref they refused to repent, and it says, they did not repent of the work of their hands or give up the worshiping of demons and idols, gold and silver, bronze and stone, which cannot hear or see or walk. They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their immorality or their thefts. They basically said, let us continue to do whatever we want, when we want, the way we want. We will not have God rule over us. Boom. And so before the final judgments come, we have a series of presentations, a series of revelations. And in chapters 10 and 11, we actually have three witnesses or three testimonies that are presented. It comes, first of all, in the testimony of a great angel. It comes, secondly, in the testimony of two identified witnesses who work within the earth. And it comes, third, in the testimony of the 24 elders, those people we saw back in the throne room in chapters 4 and 5. Those who I believe represent the people of God, 12 representing the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 representing the disciples and the church. And those 24 elders come again at the end of chapter 11, and they will be issuing a testimony or a witness about Jesus Christ. So in chapters 10 and 11, we have this interlude when we get to see, if you will, into the heart of God in the midst of all this judgment. And that's the way you need to kind of have it unflowing in your mind as you read these words. And so now we come to chapter 10, verse 1. And John records this. He says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs were like pillars of fire. And he had a little scroll open in his hand, 
And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write them down. Let me stop there for just a minute, because I will tell you, this passage gets all kinds of, of interest in the commentators and the scholars. And, and we have this idea of this amazing appearance of a mighty angel, apparently very large and very dominant, with all of these fantastical images, uh, the face like the sun and the legs like fire and the rainbow surrounding the head. And it's like, what does it all mean? And I'm here to tell you, I do not know. And I have studied this and read dozens of commentaries on it. Many people feel it's a representation of Christ, the, the description of the face like the sun and the fact that the rainbow reflects what was said about the rainbow around the throne where Christ sat back in Revelation chapter 4. And the idea of the, of the, uh, um, the, the legs like fire. And more than that, that he's holding an open scroll and it was the lamb who was worthy to open the scroll. And I'm going to say to you, if this is a manifestation of Christ, wonderful. But the text doesn't tell me that. And I don't see any place else where it hints to that. And here's the kind of challenge I have with that. I have the challenge that says, after Bethlehem, Christ's incarnation took on the form of man. And when he represents himself throughout eternity, as we understand it, he represents himself in relationship with, with mankind. I will be their God. They will be my people. I will dwell with them. And we have this living relationship with Christ. It said that he goes away and he goes to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we also may be and we will dwell with Christ forever. And part of that dynamic is that we will be able to understand and know him. And for me, that idea of the incarnation being eternal and staying with God is very important. Now, people say, well, there are other manifestations where he is presented as the king of kings and lord of lords, and we have him with the sword out of his mouth, and we have him as the lamb that was slain. So they say, you know, this is just another manifestation, perhaps. And I'm going to say, perhaps. But in all of those other places where those manifestations occur, we're given clear indication that this is Christ, and that the manifestations are telling us something specific about his character, or his power, or the role that he's playing when he's described as the lamb that was slain, and it's in that fulfillment of his work as the one who sacrificed himself for the payment of our sins. We know why that image is presented. Nothing like that is given to me here in chapter 10. And so this is what I want to say. Don't push your speculation farther than the text reveals. That's always dangerous. So yes, this might be Christ and it might be not. I don't know. But it's presented, obviously, as a great heavenly messenger, this great angel who has something important to reveal, and in his hand is this scroll. And something about that scroll is announced that John hears. It says that this voice, roaring like a lion, comes at him. And there are like the seven thunders. And some people say, is that the voice of God? Probably. Again, I'm not sure. It doesn't say but he reveals something. God says something, and John hears it and says John picks up his pen and starts to write it down, and the voice, which may be the voice of God, the seven thunders, says, don't. I was about to write, and I heard the voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And at this point, I'm going, well, thanks a lot, God, for teasing me with that. Because now I'm doubly curious to know what it says. And you know what God says to me? Get used to disappointment. <laughs> because he doesn't tell me. In fact, he tells me specifically he doesn't want me to know. And you say, what's the point of that? And here's what I think the point of it is. The point of it, I believe, is that God is setting John up to experience something that mankind doesn't normally get to experience. And that's, God is sending John up to experience 
how God responds to his own revelation. I don't think God wants us to know what the details of the scroll are because then we'd get all, you know, antsy to analyze the details and care about the details and worry about the details and try to build a chart or a graph or a timeline or a spreadsheet that explains what the details are and try to align them with some events in our lives and our experience and on the earth. And I don't think God wants any of that to happen because he's trying to say to John at this point, I want you to hear something about me and how I'm responding to this entire experience of the judgment that as the eternal just God of the universe, I am required to pour out upon the people. So don't worry about the details that are in the scroll. That's for me to know. I want you to understand how the scroll affects me. I think that's what God is saying. He intentionally wants to hold back the content so that we will understand the effect of that that scroll. And that's what we pick up here in the rest of chapter 10. It says, "Seal uh, Seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write them down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, I'll do it this way, raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and what is in it and the earth and what is in it and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay. That's powerful. Because as I understand the unfolding of this story, this is the big answer to the question from the fifth seal. And that is, how long will you wait to bring judgment on the sin of the world? How long? And now, as the final set of judgments, the bowls are about to be released. Now, at the end of the judgments of the seals and the judgments of the trumpets, as mankind stands in rebellion, now... In that moment, God says to John, take a breath, John. Before I unleash that final set of judgments, I want you to know something. I don't want to do this. I think that's what God's saying. He's saying, John, I want you to know something. As the eternal, righteous judge as the transcendent, universal God of all creation. I don't want to do this. You say, Dave, where do you get that? I get that from what the angel asks John to do. He says, the angel stands now and swears by the one who created heaven and earth. There will be no more delay. Delay in what? Delay in bringing the judgment. Remember in 1 Peter chapter 3? God is not slow concerning his promise, as some men count slowness, but is patient, not willing that any should perish. 1 Peter 3 is all about judgment. It refers back to the, to the uh, judgment of Noah and the flood upon the earth that judged mankind and wiped out mankind because of their sin. And it warns that that will come again, only the next time it will not be a flood that destroys the earth, but it will be fire from heaven. All that is in Peter's prophecy. But in the midst of that, there is this statement that says that God is patient. And because of that, certain people of the earth rise up and they are scoffers, and they don't believe it's ever going to happen. And they say, where is this judgment that is promised? And Peter reminds them that God is patient Why? Because he doesn't want to bring the judgment. Because he does not want to judge and condemn his children, the people he created, even in their rebellion and sinfulness. And as I see Revelation 10 unfold, I see it as another depiction of that same truth in the heart of God. He's come now through the seals and he's come now through the trumpets and he's about to unleash what we will be told and come to know is the final set of judgments that will bring it all to an end. And before he does, he starts by answering that question that the martyrs asked. How long 
And he says, no longer. There will be no more delay. And so it says that the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand and swore by him who lives forever and who created heaven and what is in it and the earth and what is in it and the sea and what is in it that there would be no more delay but, wow, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God, that is his righteous judgment, would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants the prophets. There will be no more delay, but the judgment is coming now. And then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again saying, go and take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and the land. And so I went to the angel and I told him to give me the little scroll and he said to me, take it and eat it and it will make your stomach bitter but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey and I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it and it was sweet as honey in my mouth but when I had eaten it in my stomach my stomach was made bitter and I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings you ever had that happen it's the question I asked you at the beginning you ever eaten something that was sweet in your mouth and then a little bit later it made your stomach sick? I believe that what we have here is a presentation where this mighty angel that stands on sea and land comes. Is it Christ? I don't know. Maybe. Is it a great messenger of God? I don't know. One or the other. But the message is this. In this hand is a scroll I don't know what's on it, and I'm not going to speculate. I personally have some ideas based on other things, but I'm not even going to share those because we're way down the road of speculation. All I know is that the very voice of God thundered out something about that scroll and then said to John, it's not for normal people to know. This is for God alone. Seal it up. But what I want you to do is take these words this very scroll that describes something about the judgments of God, and I want you to do something really unusual. I want you to eat it. And you go, what? No, no, read it to me. Let me understand it. Let me dissect it. Let me define it. Let me chart it. Let me somehow, no, no. He goes, I don't want you. I want you to experience it. I don't want you to know it. I want you to experience it. Why? Because I want you to experience something that God experiences. It's his word, it's his voice, it's his scroll, it's his knowledge, it's something that is being held to him. He's intentionally not revealing it to us. Why? Because he doesn't want us to know it. He wants us to experience it. And what's the experience? It tastes really good in the mouth. And in the end, it makes me sick. You know what I think that is? I think that's God's judgment. I don't think we appreciate the extraordinary tension in the being of the transcendent, eternal, holy God of the universe. A tension that has existed since, well, since Adam and Eve. A tension that has existed since, since Satan and his angels first rebelled. A tension that says a just and holy and righteous God must eventually judge. And when he judges, he must exact the punishment of that judgment in the condemnation. The condemnation of Satan, yay! The condemnation of his angels, yay! The condemnation of mankind who rebel and refuse to repent and are condemned to eternity in judgment. Yay? And those martyrs are crying out, how long? Because we want the sweet taste of judgment. We want to be done with temptation. We want to be done with sinfulness. We want to be done with the hurt and the destruction of a broken and a cursed world. It's time to end it. Oh, Lord, won't you bring judgment? And he goes, here it is, and it's going to taste so sweet when you bite it. 
the reality of truth and the reality of righteousness and the reality of justice will be poured out upon the earth and we will say, King of kings and Lord of lords, he's finally in command and all that is evil is done away with and all that is left is good and true and righteous and the blessed will be able to go into heaven for eternity and we go, yay, how sweet is that? Until we figure the cost until we calculate that once that day comes, the patience is over. The offer of grace is over. The opportunity for unbelievers to repent and turn away from their selfishness and their pride and turn back to God is over. And it makes God sick to do what he must do and condemn unbelieving mankind to judgment. He says, John, I want you to taste it. I want you to experience it. I want you to know that this is not what I want to do. It was never God's plan that mankind would suffer. It was never God's plan that mankind would be judged. It was never man's Plan, it was never God's plan that mankind would wind up separated from him in punishment and judgment for all eternity. That was never God's plan. It was a result of our sin. And God does not want to do it. It makes God sick. And every parent in the room knows exactly what I mean. You ever had a child who disobeyed? A child who stood up in rebellion? A child who said, I know mom and dad, you're the authority over me, but I don't care. I want to have it my way. A child who said, I don't want to listen and I don't care. A child who was willing to go out and do things that were actually dangerous for that child's well-being. And sooner or later, as the parent, as the responsible one, as the authority, you had to step in and you had to say no. And at some point, you had to bring down discipline. And you hated it. You didn't want that for your child. Oh, you wanted the peace and you wanted the structure and you wanted the well-being and you wanted the the boundaries and the discipline and the hope and all that that brings, but but you didn't want to bring the punishment. It, it, It hurts. Was it ever said to you? Oh, parents, did you ever say it? Did you ever repeat those words that every parent at one time or other has heard or uttered or every child has listened to? Class, it hurts me more than it hurts you. And not a child in the room ever believed it. And every parent in the room knows it's 100% true. There is nothing harder for a parent who loves their children and cares about their children than to know that for the good and well-being of the child there must be discipline in their lives and the parent has to bring it but knowing that at that moment the discipline is unpleasant that the discipline hurts that the discipline will probably make the child mad at mom and dad forever there's no there's no parent in the world who wants to do that and it tears at our hearts and it tears at our souls and it makes us sick to our stomach welcome to revelation chapter 10. And we get this passage wrong because we get all caught up in who is the angel and what is on the scroll. God doesn't want us to know. And we miss the point, and it's this. The unveiling of the final set of judgments that are now going to happen without any longer delay and will bring the answer to the question, how long? At that point, God is saying, and I don't want to do it, but I will. And the truth and justice will taste sweet for a moment in the mouth. And it's going to make God sick. And it should make us sick too. And that's where the final statement comes in. Because the angel took the little scroll and the... uh, 
And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it in my stomach, it was bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and many nations and many languages and many kings. Prophesy what? Prophesy the hope of Jesus Christ. Prophesy that he has come now to offer forgiveness and redemption that it is now that his mercy and his love is operational. And here's the point. When we read the book of Revelation, we should quit worrying about what the timeline means for us and talk rather about the to- what the timeline means for those who do not know Jesus. Because what the book of Revelation is challenging us to do is to get to everyone before the judgment comes and win them to the blessings and glories of salvation so that they will not be part of a judgment that makes God sick and should make us sick as well. And so John is told, go out and do what the prophets have been doing since back there in Psalm chapter 2. Remember the warning? It says, be warned, take heed, let him who has has an ear to hear, hear. Don't let the righteous king judge you. Rather, find the extraordinary love of the merciful Savior who wants to redeem you. I've said from the time we started this study that I do not like the book of Revelation because it is hard. And it's not just hard because it's symbolic and it's tricky to interpret or understand. It's hard because the message is judgment and because the challenge is responsibility for us. And if we really hear this, what the message is saying is this, when we have to eat that bitter scroll of judgment, we want to make the sweetness as great as it can be and the bitterness as small as it need be. And the only way that happens is if we see those people whom Christ loves saved before the judgment comes. You want to keep God from being sick? You want to make yourself a little bit less queasy when judgment arrives and we're in heaven and we see the real unfolding and the cost for all humanity? Then do not hesitate. Go to your friends. Go to your coworkers. Go to your neighbors. Yes, even go to those enemies who deserve the judgment that they get. And remember, we all deserve it. And thankful for the grace of Christ which has come to us, take the prophecy and share it to everyone you meet. Live Jesus, the sacrificing, loving, saving, redeeming Jesus. Live Jesus across the street and around the world because if we don't, the judging, righteous, holy, condemning King Jesus will encounter all mankind. Our Father and our God, we just pray that you will move our hearts. Let us experience what you experience, even to the queasiness of our stomachs as we understand the cost of final judgment. Lord, let us seek to redeem every being that we can from that judgment to the bliss and the glory of the hope we have in a place prepared for us where we will dwell with you for all eternity, caught up in the resurrection, blessed by the hope of being cleansed and wearing your righteousness and present with you forever. Oh Lord, let that be our heart today. And we ask you therefore to bless our message as we carry it forth and let each of us truly live Jesus, his love, his compassion, and his saving grace across the street and around the world for your glory, we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us?
remember that our blessed hope is Jesus Christ. Amen? Go out and share him with this world. God bless you guys. See you on Friday.